This is tuna on toast. Murph is coming over and we're gonna play some golf out here. And I, I don't know if he has real nice shoes. I mean, I just have these. I don't want Murph stepping in Bonsai's dog poop. So I gotta clean up right now. Oh my God. I stepped in dog crap as I was cleaning it. God dang it, I gotta take these out. I gotta change shoes now. See, that could have been Murph. It's a beautiful day on tuna on toast. A beautiful day on tuna on toast. I don't even need to unlace those. What am I talking about? I stepped in dog poop. All right, I'm ready. Oh, damn, there he is. Hold on, hold on. He's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. I can't see. Hello, who is it? It's Murph. Listen to that voice. Look at the shape right there. Hi. Yes! I can't believe this! How are you doing? How are you? Good to see you. Good Great, to see thank you. you. Oh my god, thank you for being here. Of course, thank you for having me. Great place. All right, Murph. Oh, yes, Here's please. what we're doing today. Okay. We got a lob wedge and a sand wedge. I'm going to give you these two okay. right now. Thank you. I have a tennis ball and two golf balls. Oh, I'm going to blade we're it. We're surrounded you by houses and windows. <laughs> You're going to hit on the left side of the pool. I'm okay. going to try to catch your shot over there. Okay. Are you upward? Yes. <laughs> All right, watch your head here. Okay. You'll sit in that chair. Whoa. This one on the right? Yes, uh, the, 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 that one right there. Yeah, okay, great. Where did I put my uh, coasters? I had coasters. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tuna on Toast. I am Ted Stryker, so excited. My guest drove over to my house today. You know him from the Wombats and of course, Love, Fame, Tragedy. Matthew Murphy is here. Hi. Murph, how the heck are you? I'm very good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So for those of you listening, you should watch this on YouTube because Murph just accomplished something in my backyard with a golf club, a golf <laughs> ball, and I had a baseball mitt on. It was beautiful. Did you have fun doing that? At any time I get to swing a golf <laughs> club, I'm having the best time ever, yeah. Is, so, is golf something you took up? Uh, in your 20s, teens, uh, when did you start playing? Um, when I was 13, and um, I got very, very hooked, and um, all I ever wanted to be was like a tour pro, but I wasn't good enough. But I got I got pretty good, and all my friend group I was playing with, we were all kind of good. And then um, the Wombats kind of took off in the UK, and I was on tour, and they just kept getting better, and I just kind of got a little bit worse. And um, I, My handicap's three, but... Um, all my kind of friends back home are all like plus one, plus two now. But you're still a three right now. Mm, yeah, that's my handicap, but I, I think I shoot high 70s. That's a great, lot. though. Yeah. Um, when you were playing back then, before the Wombats started to take off, before but you still had the Wombats going, did you feel that same competitive spirit in the band in terms of succeeding as you did when you were out playing 18? Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> It was kind of wild in the early days of the Wombats. Kind of, I was just calling our manager every day, asking why haven't we? What's why has that not happened? Mm. Where's this? And um, yeah, I think that competitive spirit is um, has been with me all the way. Yeah, right. Uh, when you go on tour, so uh, M Shadows from the band Avenged Sevenfold was here recently. Yeah, and he is. He's a great golfer as well. And I think maybe in the early days, I'm not saying he was out partying on the road or anything, but he takes his clubs when they're when they're going. Is that something you plan on doing when you start the tour in January? Um, I have attempted it in the past. Okay. Um, and our tour manager gets just so pissed off with me when Why? I'm taking my golf clubs around and like the crew have <laughs> got to put it on the bus and take it off and stuff. Maybe on days off I'll go the range, but I, I yeah I don't go to like a golf course when it's like a show day, just because of the rigmarole of like getting a cab, finding the course. By the time I've done it, I'm played eighteen. Yeah. I'm like kind of knackered. So yeah. So we're three or four weeks away from the new record coming out. Yeah. Not professionally, but mentally, 
How are you feeling leading up to this? I mean, the world has gone through crazy hell. We all have. I'm sure we'll get into it, but how you made this album, like, how are you feeling with the release of all of the songs being out there and then hitting the road? The truth or the, do you want the truth or the kind of? Uh, take a deep breath and give me the truth. <laughs> okay. Um, it's really kind of wild for me at the moment because I've never, If I feel like the four weeks prior to release, there's lots of promo, lots of emails, lots of, you know, stuff that I have to do. But I've never done it with two toddlers before. And so it feels really quite, um, quite mad this time. But I'm enjoying it. And like, I love the album, really proud of it and excited to get it out. But um, it's uh, it's hard to balance the the craziness of home life and the craziness of work life. And like, I'm like, shit, how do I kind of play golf or do some yoga in the middle or something? Right. Yeah. Um, and then what about making the record? with toddlers there did you do it did you record much of it where you live here in southern california yeah only had one toddler then so it was okay. a bit easier <laughs> um but yeah the well dan and Todd came to la in 2019 and we wrote a bunch of songs and about four or five made it to the album and then when the world went to hell in a ham basket kind of i finished it off in my studio in at home in mount washington and um yeah, and then we recorded it separately um was quite a strange process it was enjoyable though like I really enjoyed the recording process because I worked it was like nine to five days with an engineer in Highland Park and um I didn't have to do any of the debating or any of the stuff that usually goes into an album especially like a fifth album with two people that you've been in a band with since you were 18 um so it was kind of great then the putting together of it afterwards was that was the most kind of challenging part. Mm. We had to press delete a lot. You had to press delete a lot. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you say delete, does that mean, wait, what are you deleting then? Verses, choruses, songs that you completed, songs that don't fit in 2022? No, not not whole songs. Just, um, you know, there was, we would get on a Zoom call in my morning, their evening in London, and we would discuss like what changes we wanted to make what our kind of visions were for the song. Um, and that was quite, you know, good. That was a good idea. And then as time progressed, the Zoom calls got shorter and shorter and shorter, mm. less and less got discussed. And then there was n there were no, there was not much communication and everyone was on different parts of different songs, kind of doing their own thing. And then when um, Mark Crew, who I guess was the kind of main producer of the album, although there are others on the um when he started sending things to us, we were all just like, "What? what's that? What's this? What's that? Mm. So um, we had to kind of, you know, kill our darlings a little bit. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes, I'm not saying that was you were, it was fat that you were trimming, but sometimes in everything anyone does, it doesn't have to be entertainment, sometimes trimming the fat can make it actually better, even though you love that fat so much. Yeah. You take it away and it's like, oh, wait, hold on. Maybe that was kind of cool. I think it does. And I think we're getting better at it. I, the, the hard thing, you know, if I imagine it like a, a song or a record, like a kind of painting. And the more and more stuff you add, like imagine the Mona Lisa, if it had a load of other crap <laughs> in the background, but it's there now and you've seen it and like you start getting used to it being there. So it becomes more and more difficult to actually take it away. Um, that's something that we, I think we're pretty good at now. Murph, the name of the album, Fix Yourself, Not the World. Is that an observation based on watching the news for two years <laughs> and seeing how a bunch of lunatics act? And then when they go behind closed doors, some of them are probably doing some things that they wouldn't want out in the public. Or is that a more uh, personal thing, that, that line that um, maybe you experience in your own life? Yeah, it kind of comes from many angles and it's certainly i'm not saying you know activism is pointless or whatever but um i mean i remember when i suggested this title to dan and todd yeah. and our management like it it automatically got into this kind of you know there were long debates and conversations about it and i was like well yeah okay that's kind of the point um but yeah it, it came from yeah people uh, espousing things outside of their own house and then doing the complete opposite behind closed sure. doors yeah um, it came from me just really 
being tired of other people's opinions on social media and it became and it's also about kind of trying to fix highly complicated issues with extremely low resolution ideas um and it's also like yeah i also kind of think it's you know you it's good to shake your fist at the outside world but it's important that you shake your fist at yourself as well and i think you'll get to from a to b quicker it's a, it's about a, a million kind of things i guess i don't know yeah but everything you just said made total sense yeah <laughs> um a song that i have been singing non-stop and i really love the video um if you ever leave i'm going with you yeah i that song just the song title if you ever leave i'm going with like i know how the song goes from the song title <laughs> where in creating the new record was that one of the first songs you did have you been holding on to that one for a long time the lyric i've been holding on to for a long time yeah. it was kind of a sweet thing that my wife said to me in the beginning of our relationship kind of similar to a song from my fourth album turn which said i like the way your brain works and i was like okay yeah. kind of jotted those down next to each other and i think i was trying to shovel it into the fourth album at some point but it didn't work and um yeah i mean it's definitely kind of the probably the poppiest song on there or one of two and um I'm not quite sure it fits the rest of the album. Mm. It's, it's kind of more synthy and poppier than the rest of the stuff. But um, you know, I, I, it's a it's a it's a catchy number. It's a it's a great great song. Where'd you do the video for it? <gasps> out here South, somewhere? Yeah. Oh, you did it out here. Like it's just it's just South, you and South. It. Nice. It's really really good. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. When you I mentioned a second ago that you jot down phrases that you may hear, or if it's your wife, whatever it is, is that something that you, you do it into your phone or you write it down and you put it in your nightstand next to your bed? What do you do? Just write it down in my notes on my phone and then kind of just constantly scrolling through it, trying to find wow. starters or whatever. Man. Yeah. Does it shock you at all that you have had, that you've been doing this for so long, the same three guys in this band, starting all those many years ago, meeting at school or something, and then here you are playing big venues all around the world, man. Yeah, um, I am pretty shocked by that, to be honest. Um, I don't think we ever saw ourselves having a career this long, especially when a lot of our kind of peers and contemporaries at the time, especially in the UK, it was coming out like 2006, 2007, aren't really around much anymore. Um so I mean, yeah, we're, we're super grateful, and I think somewhere along the way, we just kind of adopted this bulldog mentality where we drowned out the noise a bit. We were less focused on writing the biggest song planet Earth had ever heard before, and we just kind of focused on what we were good at and stayed on that path. Yeah, and it seems like that from early on, oh six, oh seven, oh eight, oh nine you were able to attract people to maybe one or two songs. They see you play. Then they do a little bit of a dive into some of the older stuff. And then because the content and the quality is so good year after year, you've got them. But I know some folks who only know of you from like three years ago. And yeah. like, what a great, what a great trajectory for a band. Yeah, no, it's, um, it seems like uh, it's, it's been one kind of, slow snowball really i don't ever feel like we had the kind of arctic monkeys like shump you know uh straight up into the stratosphere it's kind of just right. been this kind of mild but very tall hill we're climbing yeah was there a goal early on for you personally once you and the guys were official like we're the wombats let's do this what was your plan what was your goal I don't, I mean, especially for the first album, I don't know, I don't know what the goal was. It was just kind of, we were in A guy to love, loss and, and des desperation, yeah. And, but there was something before that that only went to Japan or something, but you consider this one the full oh, yeah. first one, right? First official? Girls, Boys and Marsupials was like the first yeah. album that we only released on a Japanese label. And huh. then we, and then we did our kind of first proper album. Um, uh, but I don't know if there was a goal. We were just having fun and... I was loving writing songs, and then maybe after, I think when we got a bit of success, then the goals were like, right, okay, let's get smashed all over radio, and yeah. you know, we were we we wanted a lot, but now, and I think this was around the third album period. It's like 
I don't really want to be in a band that has these huge peaks and troughs. It's like I kind of want to want us to be a kind of Pixies esque band where you're just like that's the one that's and that's kind of the the path that I feel like I'm on at the moment. Wait, you tour with the Pixies, right? Yeah. And what made was Weezer on? No, I don't know if Weezer was on. Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. It was us. Yeah. Then, uh, Pixies, then Weezer. So was, was there, fun. even though you're experienced, you're a veteran, you know what the hell you're doing. Is there anything that you learned from the Pixies being on the road, or did you go this way when you got to the venue and they went that way? Um, no, we um, we hung out with the Pixies a lot. Uh, we oh, didn't. Cool. We didn't, not much with Weezer. I think the gigs were very big, and like I think Rivers was kind of you know keeping himself on track and. Um, but uh, got became really good friends with Joey and we play golf a bit and he was on my Love Fame Tragedy record and um but what did we learn? I mean I learned that um Black Francis has some fucking unbelievable guitars. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Speaking of Love Fame Tragedy, there are some um wonderful collaborations. Even some writing collabs where the voice was, I think Dan may have co-written a song, but he didn't sing. Yeah. Um, would you ever do collabs? And Or maybe you have, and I'm misspeaking, like Wombats, where you bring someone in and you're like, hey, let's sing together on a track or two. Um, have we, we haven't done that on this album, but um, yeah, we've, we've done the occasional collaboration, but it's not a road we've been down a lot, but maybe in the future. Right. Yeah, because it's just really enjoyable. It's nice kind of getting, you know, taking other people's talents and using it for your own good. Um, as we're sitting here in Los Angeles and uh, you live not too far from here, why is it L.A. that you decided to live? Well, I came here out the blue um, to kind of, I got an Airbnb and like wrote for two weeks and um, met my wife, now wife, on, on that trip. And she moved back to London for a year to be with me, but was always under the premise that we would move back to the sunshine. And I've always kind of loved LA and we've recorded a lot out here. And yeah. like, I I just feel, I always say, I just feel 10 to 15% happier. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. And you, uh, obviously you drive yourself around here. Are you a good driver Are you, or do you hate driving here? It's been raining in LA. I live in a weird place. Well, I hate driving in the rain because it seems like <laughs> everyone just shits themselves and doesn't know what to do anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love driving around LA. It's such a, it's such a colorful kind of vibrant city. And I think just ingesting all the it sounds kind of weird, but all the colors compared to like London in the autumn or winter, it's very different here. And I just think, yeah, I'm, I'm 10 to 15% happier. Therefore I kind of, you know, write 10 to 15% more songs than I used to do when I was living in the UK. Wow. You've been at home for almost two years and we talked about the new album coming out in January, but also the big tour is starting are you like in the starting blocks, like a track star to get the hell out of the house and go do your thing? <laughs> you love your family, of course, but I mean, this is your career, man. You haven't been out really a ton in front of people in a, in a very, very long time. And now it's like, uh, J January is here, man, in less than a month and you're going. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I haven't quite got my head around it, to be honest. Um, uh, we're all really, really excited, but we're trying to take it with a, we're trying to be a little bit realistic as well because I mean, surely some of these shows are going to get pulled and some mm. things are going to happen. But you know, we've just got to keep our fingers crossed and, and and hope that it all works out. But we're so excited to play the new album live, and we were I just got back from London where we spent two weeks just oh. keep putting it together and rehearsing it. You did stuff. you so you okay so you've rehearsed in person? Yes, with Dan, yeah, yeah. you have. Yes, and was it easy? Difficult? Playing the new songs, knowing the lyrics, playing some of the older stuff. Oh, knowing the lyrics was difficult. It was. But, um, but the, um, yeah, it actually went really, really well um, and wasn't that that tough. Um, so, yeah, we're excited. to, And we're, we're doing these kind of buzz shows in the UK and we're just going to play the new album from start to finish. And, oh, you nice, know, maybe, man. Maybe chuck him a Greek tragedy or Joy Division at the end. But, right. Oh, yeah. Um, but mainly just new album in full so that when the the real touring starts in washington dc um 
we know what we're doing and we're ready for it. Yeah. Yep. And you're playing the Wiltern here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, do you remember where your first show or two were when you guys first played a gig here? Where it was? Was it Satellite? Space. Oh, um, it was what well, we did two shows. One was the satellite, and one yeah. was another place, uh, which I can't remember. My friend Corey was at the satellite show. Okay, he knew of you because he got a promo disc. Oh yeah, he's like, I don't know what this is, but I'm going to put it in, and he fell in love with you. And he said, at that show, you know, it wasn't crazy crowded, but there were some Definitely people. There, not. Were, okay, fine. He <laughs> said there were forty people there. Yeah. He said there were forty and fifty, maybe. Yeah, but he's the one that told me about you guys because of that random disc that he had a promo cd and then oh, wow. going to that show at the at the satellite wow that's great was that um did it feel like an accomplishment when you guys come to the u.s and play shows here yeah it does now because i think we've worked so hard over here to kind of get it to a you know a good level i suppose um and that was really off the back of the second album um but yeah um love playing over here and um I just remember those first two shows in LA, our first ever time in LA, and oh my god, we went for it so hard. In I terms I to, of, I think I had to cancel a show afterwards. <laughs> I, I had to cancel a San Diego show for um, Aaron Axelson. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he's from San Francisco. So San Francisco. That's yes. One, yeah. Yeah. I, um, we we went for it so hard. I lost my voice, and I was just like, I can't do it. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. When you say you went for it, does that mean when the show ended you went for it, or you were on stage and you turned it up eighteen notches? Oh no! After the after the first show, we went for it, and then that kind of bled into the second show, and then I think that bled outwards into like the next day, and then we flew to San Francisco, and we, I was broke. Oh no! Yeah, it was perfect introduction to LA. I think. Right. Yeah. More than seven times in your career, or less than seven times in your career where something like that has happened where it's like uh oh we Wait, is it bad if it's over 7 no okay. not um, at all i would almost say it's probably 7 because we've done a lot of shows um but only really oh, no actually i've i've pulled a few shows so i've lost my voice but i'd say only really 3 or 4 in 15 years that have been self-inflicted okay yeah <laughs> Is it hard for you, whether it's this album or any song you've ever written for any of your projects, to let it go? So you spend all this time writing and putting it together, and then it's sitting in your laptop for, I don't know, a month or five months, and you could tinker with it every single day if you wanted to, Murph. Is it is it hard for you to say, okay, I'm done? Um, not anymore, but it used to be. Uh, I would tinker with things and edit them and try new stuff but sometimes you know th there is like a core to a song and if that isn't good enough or that's not sparking enough joy or energy within you then um by the time you've tinkered around with it for days you could have written a better one. Oh wow um so i'm 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 good at letting it go and yeah i'm better at that now um, I heard you mention before that you do love songwriting, but the first 10 to 20 percent is always very difficult for you. Yeah. Can you explain that to me, like what that means exactly? Well, that's kind of why I always write titles down in my phone, because I feel like if I go into a studio with an idea or with a title that um, gives me lots of imagery, um, I could title like lemon to a knife fight or something oh, i love that song i, I can yes. i can um i'm on board with it like I, i'm there and i will fight to the death to kind of get that from just being a title into something that has melodies and ideas and stuff but if i don't have that initial if i just turn up and hope for the best then it can be murky waters for for three four five ten hours Wow, and it's those murky waters where the best stuff comes from, but it's also the hardest place to be. I think, yeah. Um, again, for those listening or watching, the album is not out yet, but one of the song titles I remember is uh, for the new record is called "Poke the Bear." Don't poke the bear. Don't. Sorry. Oh, no, no, it's called "Poke the Bear." Oh, it no, is you're, called you're "Poke right. the Bear." Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't need to know what it means, but where in the world did that come from? Uh, it's been in that's it, that's been in the in the notes bank for a long time. Um, but yeah, that's kind of. Some, crazy kind of like 
Queens of the Stone. Well, it's not that crazy. It's kind of like a Queens of the Stone Age swung kind of mm. heavy guitar sound with really mad lyrics. Todd gave me a cold um, <laughs> when when they were in LA, and I just remember walking around Mount Washington, like trying to figure out what the hell was happening. And it's a fairly ambiguous song. Let's put it that way. Okay, uh, people don't change. Time does. People don't change. People time does. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, that is kind of a cool kind of death cabby ghost of Beverly Hills inspired song that is about this aspiring um, actor moving to L.A. with um, all these dreams and <laughs> them slowly kind of being pulled apart. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Where did you grow up in the U.K.? In Liverpool. In Liverpool? Yeah. Okay. I've been to London once for four days, so I'm sorry that I... Like, how far is Liverpool from London? Is that... It's t- two and a half hours on the train. Oh. Two, no, actually, it's two hours on the oh, train. Oh, really? Right? Yeah. Okay. And what is the... Was there, like, a music scene for you growing up there? I know we talked about that you were into golf, but did you go see bands play growing up? Oh, yeah. There was, you did. There's tons of small venues, and Liverpool's always been great at kind of helping young bands out and... Even at that time, though, in the 2000s, late 90s time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, like, bands would help each other out. And oh, cool. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I was in all manner of um, bizarre, bizarre <laughs> outfits. Um, I was in, like, a Radiohead covers band for a bit. It was very strange. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's tons of great places to play up in Liverpool. A lot of them are closed down, but I think, as m- you know, as many have closed down, new ones have popped up, so... I think that was a great city to to learn how to do what we do. You mentioned Radiohead in one of your new songs, and I think you do like Radiohead, but when you're in that covers band, there's a lot to live up to if you're covering Radiohead songs. Yeah. So that of all the bands out there, I would think, ah, oh, maybe I don't know if I want to do the Radiohead <laughs> cover well, band. I had my, we had our own band um, that covered a lot of Radiohead stuff and a bit of Weezer as well. Okay. And we would kind of go and play pubs and stuff. I once auditioned for an actual Radiohead tribute band. You did? Called Fake Plastic. Okay. In Liverpool. <laughs> and I didn't get the job. Thank God you <laughs> didn't get the job, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Doing Paranoid Android every single night. Everyone's like, yeah. all right, come on. I'm going to keep my arms crossed. Let's yeah, do it yeah. good here. Yeah, I think in the first rehearsal, I just forgot way too many lyrics. And I was like, yeah, I can't even remember my own anyway. So, um um, and what school did you, you went to college? Uh, I, yeah, I went to Liverpool College, where that was up till 18, and then I went to uh, Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts, the place that Paul McCartney set up in Liverpool, yeah. Wow, and that's where you met uh, your bandmates? Yeah. Wow, and what was it about Dan and Tord that, like, that attracted uh, you to them to be friends and start a band? Yeah, me and Dan kind of hit it off straight away we were in kind of um rival schools in south liverpool uh, even before we went to university and um we used to play cricket against each other and um yeah uh, and then we met at lipper and kind of you know had some fun nights out and i would wake up in his kind of like halls of residence we, right. we call them student halls and yeah we just hit it off really well and um and then Todd was like in nine bands at the time he was just like spreading himself real thin and we were we were one of the ones that um we we were just one of the nine and then as time went on it became he was in eight other bands then seven then six then five or well, then there was two um and uh we got a record deal first i guess i don't know wow did you have to audition to get into that school yeah you did yeah and what did what did you do and were there like three people at a boardroom table with like with a yellow notepad or i can't remember now i think i had to i think i just played them a song and thankfully they they kind of liked it and then you were in yeah just like that and were your folks pretty supportive about you being in the arts yeah especially my dad i mean he kind of had me playing classical guitar when i was like five years old and um yeah he, he he's pretty musical and he was um yeah he was really really helpful that's so at five years old you could play a little bit of guitar yeah like um yeah classical guitar were you hooked on it ever hooked on guitar like you were on on golf like where it's like you couldn't wait to get home and play practice no 
<laughs> like I, 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 sometimes I, I couldn't. You know, I, I never really practiced for the classical stuff, and I did like some grades or whatever, and I got pretty good at it. But then I kind of discovered the electric guitar and songs, and that was the kind of path I went down. I was never kind of like, you know, grinding out scales or anything. Right. Um, although I did have to do a bit of that during my music degree. Um, yeah. Uh, you mentioned a second ago, you got the record deal. So now you got the three, you're off and running. Was there a certain uh, show that you guys did in Liverpool where someone said, wait a minute, wh who, who are these dudes? There is something there. How did that happen for you? We started our own club night called Little Miss Pipe Dream, which is a song off the first album. And we used to kind of have our, you know, other bands that were doing well come and play with us and, then, then we were the first band. There was a bit of interest, and then we were the first band to ever sell out the O2 Academy in Liverpool, just like twelve hundred people without a record deal. And then um, I think that got around, and then there was kind of a handful of people coming up and offers and things like that. Yeah. Damn, that is that's very cool, man! Yeah. Wow, have your folks been? Your dad been to a ton of your shows? Do you like? When he go, he had, oh my god, yeah, okay. so many shows. So what's that like? Does he want the backstage pass and see you before? Does he stand in the back? Is he up in the front? Is he having a drink at the bar? What does he do? All of them. <laughs> he wants that. He wants the backstage pass, and he's back there, you know, chugging red wine. And my mum's kind of complaining that there's no champagne around and things like that. And it's yeah, it happens all the time. It's good fun. Oh, that's exciting, man! What yeah. an extraordinary life that you have led because of. Just like stick to itiveness and being a competitor, and of course, just uber talented, man. Thank you so wow. much. Wow, congratulations on everything. Thank you. Seriously. And what about we should wrap it right there? Yeah, let's do is it. Is that all right? Yeah, that was great. Fix Yourself, Not the World. Mm -hmm. That is the name of the album. Comes out in January. Find the Wombats on tour because they are going all over the world. Fingers crossed that it goes smoothly. For Murph, I am Stryker. That has been our show. Happy Snuggles. Bye bye. Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.